Well, good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm Peggy O'Neill, the Adult Services Publicity Programming Librarian at Penfield Public Library. And I'm delighted that you could join us for a special presentation on um, living with black bears in New York State. Uh, Dr. Paul Curtis is a professor of wildlife science in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment at Cornell University. He received a PhD in zoology from North Carolina State University and an MS in wildlife biology from Colorado State. His research interests include human wildlife conflicts in suburban, forest, and in agricultural landscapes, wildlife fertility control, and resolving community based wildlife issues. He has supervised research projects dealing with white tailed deer, black bears colonial water birds, urban goose management, and bird damage to fruit crops. And his extensive programming has included a variety of wildlife-related booklets, videos, and fact sheets. He's a co-author of the National Wildlife Control Training Program and a certified wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Society. So definitely very well qualified to do this talk on living with black bears in New York State. And the program is being recorded, so we can send you um, a recording after if you'd like. And we've, um, we've unmuted, so since it's a small group, so without further ado, we'll have Paul do his presentation. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to keep it informal today since we do have such a small group. I'm going to share my screen here so we can get started. Now you should all see the bear picture. Yes. Right. yes. So what I'd like to do today is talk about black bears in New York State. And we'll start with just some general behavioral ecology information. And you're all aware of uh, New York's black bear country. We've got a very healthy bear population. The DC estimates there's probably 6,000 or more in New York State. Bears can be seen in any upstate county. Uh, particularly the juvenile males wander quite a bit. Bears are managed by the Department of Environmental Conservation and there's a regulated uh, fall black bear hunting season in some counties in New York state, it's not statewide. And black bears are the only bear species that lives east of the Mississippi River. Historically, there were three core bear ranges in New York state. We had the Allegheny population in Southwest New York, Catskills in the Southeast and the Adirondack population. But what's happened over the last two decades is black bear is going actually really well in New York state. And this population from the Southern area has merged and now we just have a Southern bear range and a Northern bear range. And pretty soon they're gonna merge here in the Mohawk River Valley and there'll be one bear population in New York state. Um, what we try to do is manage bears uh, so that they uh, meet people's interests and needs. But when we have really populated areas like Rochester, Buffalo, Albany, uh, those areas that are really incompatible for bears, we try to keep bears out of those places. Bears live in forest. Uh, they need trees for food, shelter, and to find mates. And they can travel miles. Uh, when we were collaring bears on Fort Drum on a research project years ago, some of our male collared males were traveling 50 or more miles between summer range and their winter ranges in the Adirondacks. Uh, back, bears are excellent tree climbers, and even uh, clubs that are a few weeks old can climb trees with ease. Bears are omnivores. It means they take both plant and animal food. They take a variety of roots and tubers and nuts and sedges. They'll eat insects and animals, uh, for example, fawns if they can catch them. And occasionally bears get in trouble with agricultural crops. They, they love corn in the fall and they get in trouble with uh, apiary or honey producers. Uh, black bears diets about 80% plant material, but, so they consume mostly plants, uh, nuts and again, roots and tubers. Bears are most active for a few hours around sunrise and sunset, similar to white-tailed deer, but they're called crepuscular because uh, that's their peak activity period. Though you can see a bear any time of day, just as you might see a deer. Bears tend to den 
between October and April. Uh, the pregnant females are the first to go to den in October, and it's usually the juvenile males are the last to go to den. And some of those males may be wandering the landscape in the, in the early December, and if we get a late November, December snow, sometimes you'll see bear tracks in the snow, and those are invariably juvenile males. Bears have a really excellent sense of smell and good high sight of hearing. They can swim well, and they can run up to 30 miles an hour, so you're not going to outrun a bear. The average female black bear that we weighed is about 160 pounds in New York State, and the average male runs about 300 pounds. Bears share developed landscapes throughout much of New York. We really have neighbors bears on our property. They can pass through the backyard through their daily routine about any time of the, uh, the year when they're actually looking for food, shelter, or mates. Um, Bear sightings are reported in almost every county in New York State outside of Long Island each year. So we really do have a, a very robust bear population throughout much of New York. Sometimes they get in trouble, though. If they learn to associate people in residential areas with food, they can have uh, bad outcomes for either bears or people. And uh, bear feeders tend to be one of the number one attractions for bears in many urban suburban areas. Fortunately, and uh, since they've been keeping records in New York, we've only had one documented bear-related human fatality when an infant was killed in the Catskills in 2002. So bears usually avoid people uh, for the most part. It's good. So we have very few really high-risk encounters. Things that attract bears to our yard, bird feeders and garbage are the two biggest. But if you've got fruit trees on uh, on trees and the trees are dropping fruit, the bears will come in and take that. Uh, barbecue grills or uh, grease pits that are dirty, uh, that cooked food smells are huge attracted to them. Uh, composting, if you're putting food scraps in compost or anything besides uh, things like lawn clippings and leaf, that could attract bears. And outdoor pet feeding uh, with, with dog food, for example, will attract bears in the back. So what can we do to treat, try to reduce any type of conflicts? Uh, probably the biggest thing is feed birds in the winter months only. We all enjoy birds. We like to see birds. During the summer, they really don't need our bird feed. So if you leave, live in bear country where they're common, just take the feeders down uh, in, uh, in the summer. Months. Keep garbage cans clean and stored inside. Use bear resistant garbage containers if you're in an area with a lot of bears. Curb, curb garbage and bear resistant containers in the morning of pickup rather than letting trash sit on the curb all night. Bears forage mostly at night. And if you burn garbage, uh, if you're in a rural area, only burn non food paper products so you don't have that burnt food attractant. How else can we learn to live with bears? Again, keep barbecue pits and grills clean, use aluminum foil, get rid of geese or any of the grease that might have dripped, feed pets inside. Diapers and diaper pails are uh, surprisingly sometimes a bear attracted a dirty diaper. They think it's food. That's when the infant was killed in 2002. The infant was in a stroller in the Catskills. The parents left it for a minute, probably had a dirty diaper, and then fortunately the bear came in and snatched the infant out of the stroller. Mm -hmm. Electric fencing around compost bins and family gardens. On farm, if you're in a rural area again, eliminate garbage dumps, compost cart. This is properly buried them deeply and then house animals and livestock in buildings at night. Bear feeding in New York is against the law. You can't feed bears in life through buildings, roads, dumpsters, or campsites. And feeding is prohibited during the bear season and nine days prior to bear season. And, by removing food attractants, that's the single most important way to reduce any conflicts with bear. It's usually food that gets them in trouble. If you're camping in the Adirondacks uh, uh, or the weekend, weekending, haul your garbage to dump again. Garbage management is really important. If you're tent camping, never sleep with food in your tent. The bear can easily smell it. You don't want the bear trying to get into your tent. If you're backcountry camping in the Adirondacks, use the bear resistant food containers provided. Keep pets on a leash, hike in groups. 
If you fish, uh, take something like Tupperware, uh, where you can seal the fish smell within the container. So it's, again, not an attractant. And when, if you're hunting, if you're field dressing animals, just be aware of uh, bears might be attracted to the smell of the carcass. What happens if you walk out your back steps and there's a bear in the yard? Well, first thing, don't panic. Bears really don't want to be around people who have anything to do with people. Let the bear know you're there. Don't surprise it. Generally, what I do is yell at it, clap my hands, wave my arm, and that's usually enough to get the bear to go. Don't approach the animal. If uh, the, the bear doesn't run initially, just back away, maintain eye contact, don't run. Allow the bear an escape route. The bear is already in a tree, leave it alone. It will eventually get down on its own and leave. And uh, obviously keep children and pets from the area so they're not going to come in contact with the animal. Apiaries are one of the uh, big conflicts for bears across many parts of the state. Bears love honey. Bears have a real sweet tooth. And uh, usually a really good quality electric fence is the best way to protect apiaries to keep bears from damaging hives. Garbage management again, uh, campground is another really important issue. And you can do electric fencing again around uh, garbage facilities so people can unhook the electrified fencing, dump their garbage, then hook it back up so bears don't have access to the garbage dumpsters. The fun part of bear research and management, so when are den checks, when we go actually into the den with the females when they've got newborn cubs and uh, get genetic samples from the cubs, check radio collars on females. Bear dens, are, I've seen a variety of them throughout the state. The most typical den is actually above ground. Before I started bear research, I had this idea that they excavate these deep holes or rock crevices, which they do use. But the most common den I've seen in upstate New York are these uh, blown down trees. You just get a, a windfall where a snag's blown down that face northwest and the barrel curl up underneath the blowdown and just fall asleep and spend the winter there. And that snag is enough to keep rain and snow off of it, protects it from the wind. And they can do just fine sleeping there all winter long under a snag or in a brush pile. I've seen brush pile dens too. This is an excavated den. It was an old coyote den, which a bear came in and widened the entrance and dug the burrow out a bit more. And this is a female with two young cubs in, the, in a deeper excavated den. This is what people often think of when they think of bear dens, but probably a little bit less common than the above ground ones. During the winter months, uh, when bears are uh, sleeping, the females uh, will wake up and give birth to young in late January usually, usually about last week of January, sometimes first week of February is birthing. Uh, the young are essentially born helpless. The female uh, stays in hibernation. The young latch on to a nipple, a nurse, and then uh, are raised in the den. And often when we do our winter den checks, the youngs are usually about two to three weeks old uh, during the winter months and easy to handle. But even at that age, they've got extremely sharp claws and can climb right up a tree if they want to. We did a study at Ford Drum working uh, with Ray Rainbow, and Chris Tabani, biologists up there, trying to look at how to estimate bear populations with DNA analysis. The way our, our objectives were to try to get an idea of density of bears through a capture recapture study. Our basic methods were to capture and mark as many bears as we could with ear tags and radio collars and try to recapture that and develop encounter histories for individuals. And uh, we can enter those type of data into a computer model and get pretty good estimates of, of abundance. With traditional mark recapture, you've got to capture each animal at least twice, if not more often. And that's physically demanding and expensive. I mean, uh, just to trap a bear in a culvert trap or to uh, use a uh, cable restraint is uh, risky for the bear, it's risky for us. And so it's very time consuming and stressful for the animal. So what we try to do is minimize the number of captures. And so we'll capture the bear the first time, put ear tags and a collar on it, and then try to do resampling or recaptures by collecting hair using hair snares. So we can do DNA analysis of a, of a single hair, as long as it's got good a tuft of hair with, a, with at least a, some root material attached. 
and that way we can identify individual bears from their DNA. It's non-invasive. It doesn't require us to actually catch the animal. It's much more time efficient. And it's more accurate and precise than photo survey because you essentially know the individual from the DNA in their hair. And it's far less expensive than the traditional mark recapture that we typically use. So to design a hair snare, take anywhere from three to five trees, put strands of barbed wire about 10 inches and uh, two feet above ground, hang bait. Uh, we use sardines and bacon in a bait sack suspended from the trees above ground so the bear can't get at it, but it can smell it. And so the bear will smell that odor drifting on the breeze and then have to cross between the barbed wire to get to the bait in the center. And in doing so, they'll leave a tuft of hair on the barbed wire. We know from uh, statistics and computer sampling that we need to have a minimum of four air traps for average female home range size. We know that female home range is average about 12 square kilometers. So we set up a three by three kilometer grid of hair snares on the southwest side of Fort Drum. Here's just a a barbed wire with a tuft of hair. Uh, we go in and collect hair samples at each site weekly, uh, bag them in a, just a paper envelope, record date and time, location. And we ran our hair snares for six weeks uh, from late June to early August. Uh, peak of bear breeding activities, actually in the middle of the summer. Uh, right now, in the middle of July is the peak of breeding. So it's best to run the of uh, hair samples when the bears are really active and mobile. And we pick up a lot more animals during the summer months. We sent the hair samples to Wildlife Genetics International in Nelson, British Columbia. They're the premier lab in North America for analyzing wildlife DNA. Again, the hair samples got to have one good root. And then they analyzed them at uh, six microsatellite uh, loci uh, to give us individual identity of each animal. What we found with our research on Fort Drum, the average density was about a bear per thousand acres on post. And that's very typical to Adirondack bear density is not a big surprise. We also found from radio collaring individuals that the bears left Fort Drum uh, to gorge on corn in the fall. When the corn ripened in late August, early September, the bears just disappeared. We had to get aircraft to go find the animals and figure out where they went when they left post. The females came back and denned for the winter on post, and the males stayed off post. After gorging on corn, the males left and uh, headed for the foothills of the Adirondacks and generally denned on the Adirondack. But then the males returned to post each summer to breed with the females during June and July. So quite a bit of movement and activity. And some of our colored males, like I said, moved 50 miles or more uh, during their typical seasonal activities. Bear issues are on the rise, uh, not only in New York, but in many uh, states around the country. Actually, many of the carnivores, uh, not just bears, are doing quite well right now. Uh, fisher populations are increasing in New York. Bobcat populations are increasing in New York. Uh, the, the carnivores tend to be doing pretty well here in much of the Northeast. There are a number of uh, Bear issues and case studies in Florida, the issues with development and how to manage bears with all the intense developments going on there. In Louisiana, they're trying to restore bears to part of their former range and doing recovery. New Jersey had conflicts in the last decade to two with bears. The western part of the state as populations have grown. There have been expanding hunting seasons. New York, Maryland, and Virginia have all been in different stages of bear management planning. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Maine's got a number of bear initiatives related to baiting and hunting bears. And Ontario, Canada has been doing a lot with community-based education. So bears have been very actively managed throughout much of the Eastern US in the last decade. BC worked intensely a little over a decade ago on developing a statewide bear management plan. Uh, the basis for the, the bear plan was what they call a adaptive impact management or AIM. And impact are things that are important to stakeholders, important to people like you. And so the Department of Environmental and Conservation set up a series of surveys and public uh, stakeholder groups to try to figure out what the people of the state of New York have to do in terms of management. 
their guiding questions were, uh, what effects do you folks regard as important impacts? Is the management program for bears in New York focused on those important impacts? And what could be take actions could be taken to increase the positive in impact, like viewing bears and decreasing negative impacts, such as you know damage to bird feeders or damage to, to livestock or apiaries. Uh, Cornell uh, did a survey with our Human Dimensions Research Group uh, back in 2006. Uh, it was a male survey uh, to a number of folks throughout New York State, again, to get public about bear management. And we helped coordinate the stakeholder input groups. The SIGs, as we called them, were held regionally in different DEC regions throughout the state. And it was just groups of, you know, usually 10 to 15 people in a room for a couple of meetings talking about bear biology, bear issues, bear management, and helping guide DEC uh, to get data for the bear management plan. Uh, this was just one of the announcements that went out to try to recruit people for the stakeholder groups. Uh, the stakeholders included a variety of people, beekeepers, business owners, educators, farmers, homeowners, hunters, naturalists. You can see this long list. There's a lot of people that are interested in bear and interact with bear. And, and DEC wanted to hear from as many people as possible through, through their stakeholder process. The charge to each of the stakeholder groups was to identify Area specific impacts, for example, are the bear issues in the Catskills the same as in Western New York? And uh, the DC wanted uh, the people to describe how they think different actions would address those impacts, different management acts the agency. So people spent a lot of time thinking about things like apiary damage, damage to bird feeders, uh, viewing bears, both positive and negative impact, bear hunting and then trying to come up with uh, a management plan that would work for the people. For example, uh, the, one of the important things is looking at the goals. And one of the important goals is human risk management. They wanted to reduce conflicts between bears and people in residential areas. Well, we look at the means or how you accomplish that, there's lots of different things that can be done. You can educate people to remove food attractants. You can remove problem bears. You might condition or relocate bears, or you can increase the hunting of bears in areas that are of the state that are open to bear hunting. And what the EC found was that reducing the rate of moderate interaction was best handled by either modifying human behavior, teaching people to remove foods, or modifying bear behavior, conditioning and relocating problem bears, and where possible, hunt bears where they're overabundant. To minimize, minimize high risk interactions, uh, that's when they had to actually remove problem bears. And those are the type of situation. New York generally has a, a free strike policy. If a bear gets in trouble once, they'll usually capture it, air tag it, try adversity conditions. Sometimes if it's a, not a high risk encounter, they'll give it a second chance. They might try to relocate it to second encounter. If that same bear gets in trouble uh, a third time, it's considered a high risk animal and they generally remove it on the th third encounter. So what they try to do is through conditioning and relocation is handle as many of the problems so that you don't have to remove problem bears. There's roles for stakeholders. Again, clarifying the types of interactions that are really important and the ones that are worth management. There's roles for scientists like myself to study bears and describe events and the consequences of management action looking at the social ecological system and how bears and people interact and then trying to uh, clarify trade-offs among management alternatives trying to determine which types of management are going to be most successful there's roles for educators uh, doing programs like we are today trying to increase people's knowledge of bears and their impacts uh, try to build skills and provide opportunities for participation decision in a couple of years we'll be up for a new bear management plan in new york state so i'm not sure if dec is going to go through the stakeholder process again they may but again and then we try to help people uh evaluate implement solutions that are going to be effective to reduce conflict Wildlife manager tries to integrate the sort of the biological and social sciences, involve people in decision making, and try to design effective decision making processes. 
I mentioned the New York State Bear Management Plan. The current plan was put in place in 2014. In just uh, three years, uh, the plan will be up for revision. Uh, you can see the plan at the DEC web like the DEC bear plan. Uh, but again, DEC is probably going to be starting within the next year or so, uh, the planning process for developing uh, the next 10 year management plan for bear in New York State. Under the current plan, uh, the population goals are bears are overabundant, whether it's in orange, where the Catskills region and in increasing. So DEC has been trying to increase uh, hunting and bear harvesting to try to reduce conflicts. Where you have the darker green, that's the remaining core bear range, uh, generally moderate bear population density. DEC wants to keep those levels about where they are currently. There are as many conflicts in those areas. Where you have the darker grayish area, that's the, the new bear range where bears have been expanding. Uh, generally low population density, and uh, DEC wants to keep it that way to reduce conflicts. And then uh, along the Mohawk River corridor, I-90 corridor between Albany, Rochester, Buffalo, bears are pretty infrequent, but juvenile males and females are regularly seen in those areas, but uh, DEC wants to keep them infrequent because those are highly developed farmlands and uh, high residential density areas and uh, less compatible with bears. And the areas in black, uh, Rockland uh, County, for example, <laughs> County, Long Island, Albany area, Rochester area, Buffalo area, those are too high human density, just incompatible with bear, just try to keep bears out of those areas completely. <laughs> Lots of information online. If you want to find out more about bears in New York State and Northeast, just hop on the DEC website. There's a number of resources available for free bears PDF documents, and you can get a lot of really good information there. So with that, I'll open it up for any questions that you folks might have, and uh, hopefully you know, I've learned a little bit today about bears in New York. So um, if we were to be walking down the Erie Canal Trail and encounter a bear, we should make noise and back away. Right. I would wave my arms, yell, and clap my hands. That's been usually a sign for the bear. It's going to head the other direction. When we're trapping bears and come up to a site, sometimes, for example, we'll have one bear caught in a trap, and there'll be another bear standing outside might be a sibling, it might be a cub, and we've got the adult female, or vice versa. Uh, we do the same thing. We just clap and yell to scare off the bear that's outside the trap so we don't have to fool with it so we can handle the bear that's actually caught in the trap. So if you start yelling and screaming and acting big, the bear is going to go the other direction. They don't want to have anything to do with people. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a rare encounter when a uh, bear is actually aggressive, a black bear at least is aggressive uh -huh. towards a human, but it does happen occasionally. And that's yeah, usually absolutely. bears that have been conditioned to people and, and real, uh, relate people with food. We had one bear years ago in the Adirondacks that associated with food and backpacks. And, and I started running up to people that were hiking and stealing their backpacks off. You want to eat two of the people, but you run up and grab your backpack and run off with it because they figured there was food in it. And obviously, that's a high risk behavior in DC yeah. or the youth line right after a couple yes, of encounters. So. But again, we don't want bears to associate people and food. Another problem that develops is sometimes people in remote campgrounds will store their cooler in their car. A bear's nose is good. It knows there's food in that car. And sometimes they'll pop out a window or open a trunk like a sardine oh. just to get at the food inside and completely destroy a car. And so you wow. really got to store food properly if you're camping because a, bear, a bear's nose is so good that they, they really know how to find food. Mm. That is nice. Wow. Yeah. Other questions? No, thanks. This was tremendous. I learned so much of that three pages of notes here. <laughs> it is really, oh my goodness. I know that, well, the bear that would have, it would have probably been a black bear that was in Pittsburgh a couple of weeks ago. Is that like the only type around or I don't yeah, know. We only have black bears east of the Mississippi. Black bears, isn't that? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, I mean, you better yeah. go out west and find brown bears or grizzly bears. Yeah, yeah. right, like I out of Yellowstone. Black bears. Right. No, because I know like out at Yellowstone where they come right up to your car and then. Yeah, a few years ago, I was coming in the campus early, getting ready for 
early classes, and there was a bear right in front of Inferno here one one June wow. morning. <laughs> was there? Oh my goodness! Wow. They, they can show up just about anywhere, uh, but they're usually just passing through and don't cause any real problems mm -hmm. if people don't uh, uh, create a situation. Well, no, it's a problem. People approach them, then get the bear treat, and then you get a bunch of onlookers. And having a tree bear with lots of people around is not good. Not good for the bear or the people. And crowd management gets to be the biggest problem. They just leave the animal alone. It'll come down and leave on its own accord. So you don't have to dart it and get it out of the tree. That's always high risk for the bear and you. If a bear does, a juvenile just roams through, is there anyone we should notify or just don't say anything? Or <laughs> yeah, I really don't need to know, notify anybody, but just wandering through. Uh, DEC is aware that bear can show up anywhere. That would be yeah. the agency you contact would be the Departmental Environmental Conservation and uh, Regional Office. I think in your region, it'd probably uh, the office in Avon would probably be the closest DEC office. Uh, but. Sometimes, you know, they get curious to, of these urban bear signs, but if it's not causing a problem, just let it wander through. It'll disappear on its own accord and usually doesn't get in any trouble. Thank you. Good. Well, I think we all know more about what, if we run into a bear, what we're supposed to do. Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's really, yeah, I know. This was very enlightening, Paul. Thank you so much. Yeah, now, you've also... Um, did a couple of other talks you said to you mentioned a couple of others i think yeah, you I do just a sort of a general backyard wildlife talk we might schedule some time during the fall uh, okay. i do that talk a lot with master gardeners if you cooperate extension uh, but there's you know 15 20 species of wildlife that can commonly end up in people's backyards and some people are very savvy and know what to do and some people are very urban and haven't had to deal with wildlife before and so they've got lots of questions so yeah. Glad to talk about that too. We, we would look to, uh, forward to that. I mean, we've got deer and rabbits and groundhogs and everything else that are uh, in, in enjoying our, our gardens. All the New York and critters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. And then, you know, maybe, um, you know, when things settle down for you and all too, maybe in the, and when we're open a little bit more, we'd have an in person if that yeah. would work out for you. Too. Yeah, I would think uh, by mid to late October, maybe in early okay. November might be a good good time to do something like that. People will be a little bit more indoors at that point in the weather. Better or attendance time. probably. Yeah, no, that sounds good. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think, um, I know we have a lot of interest in gardening here and we've had some master gardener programs, but I hadn't thought about the twist with the wildlife. So that, that sounds good. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Go ahead. No, that's it. No. I've got a deer repellent study ongoing in Rochester now that I'll finish up. We've been testing a new material that just got registration in the U.S. It's been registered in Europe for a few years uh, with a sheep fat as an active ingredient. And it actually works as a pretty darn good deer repellent for ornamentals. And uh, it was great that we were able to work with uh, uh, IPM folks and test it right there in Rochester. Good. It's good to hear. No, anybody yes, they like any... to eat our flowers. <laughs> right. Yeah, which type of flowers? Uh, well, we've got daylilies and uh, irises and um, tulips. Oh, yeah, tulips. tulips yeah, they, yeah. They yeah. yeah, tulips are their favorite, absolutely by far. Uh, yeah. Lilies, uh, both daylilies and Asiatic lilies, are really high on their list. Crocuses are pretty high on their list. Oh, Most of the other uh, perennial bulbs are pretty deer resistant. Irises they will take, but they don't necessarily like. And a lot of the daffodils, again, they'll occasionally take, but they don't like. But most of the perennial bulbs are pretty darn deer resistant. You can stay away from tulips and crocuses and lilies here. You can get away with a lot of the other bulbs. Well, the, uh, I think the, Chipmunks go after the iris bulbs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is a bad chipmunk here around here. I don't know if it's the same in your area, but chipmunks are super, seem to be super abundant. I'm sure I've had a number of chipmunk complaints with them digging and burrowing. Yeah, yeah we've got a, some, something has been burrowing under our front porch. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. 
Yeah, I've noticed those two around my apartment complex and <laughs> the chipmunks too. That's really well, if folks don't have other questions, I guess I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, but yes. I uh, appreciate you participating, even though we've got a small group today. Well, well, we thank appreciate you so it. Very much. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you to the O'Briens, too, for um, following through. This is really good. And we do have a recording. And usually what happens, it's probably available about a week um, or so after. So I can send that to you, too. Okay. And that way, then you could get some of the resources that Paul listed, too, if you, you know didn't take notes on it. We'll yeah. get that. Thank, thank you, Paul. This was wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. I'm going to sign off. Thank take you. care.